Go. Okay. So I'm just going to wait for people to come in. Hello, everyone. We're just waiting one more minute for people to join. Okay, so I think uh, we can start. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Iris Bunk from uh, LIBER, uh, Communication and Engagement Officer, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this session about city science with our guest. Uh, I'm just here, the technical uh, advisor here. So just um, there will be uh, Ellen Schwamm, who will uh, chair the session and uh, introduce the speakers. Um, and if you have questions, you can uh, use the chat to, to write them down and uh, they will be answered at the end of the presentation. Um, also, you have to know that this session is recorded and uh, there will be the video available online on YouTube afterwards on the shop website. And um, uh, the slides as well will be available on Zenodo's uh, shock community. So I wish you all a very good session. And uh, I'm going to let the stage note to Helen. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the session entitled Citizen Science, what it means for social science and humanities, and how can multidisciplinarity be achieved, organized by the European Open, Open Science Cloud. Uh, my name is Helen Schwann. Uh, I'm project manager at the Innovation Opportunities Department at the University of Bordeaux in France. Um, the aim of uh, this department is to design new programs that are relevant for the innovation ecosystem inside and outside the university and uh, pilot these innovative programs with the academic staff, uh, students, administrative staff and partner. Um, the University of Bordeaux is currently part of a European project called INOS. Uh, for integrating open and citizen science into active learning approaches in higher education. Um, just a few words on these projects. Uh, it aims to modernize uh, higher education institutions curricula through civic engagement in open and citizen science. Um, it defends the fact that uh, open science and citizen science are key catalysts in shaping research uh, and society in the European Union and in the world, uh, like my guests, uh, I think. And I introduced them in two minutes. But um, before, um, I wanted to give you a small introduction to uh, the topic and the question of social science and humanities and uh, to give you some key points. Um, a small definition first, uh, I, I think it's uh, always useful. Um, citizen science can be defined as the contribution by amateurs of the collection of analysis of data concerning diverse topics and the production of data. Um, the main actors in that case can be scientists and amateurs, but not only, uh, as we can see uh, around this uh, virtual table. Um, the, the objective of these initiatives can be the production of common knowledge or indicators, as well as an appropriation of scientific culture. Uh, I use culture in the broadest sense of the term to echo uh, the two use cases uh, presented later. Um, today, uh, with the multiplication and the variety of data uh, in a lot of disciplines, and notably in social science and humanities, uh, we are facing new challenges uh, like accessibility to data to the highest number of people, but fairness of the data as well, and also ethics and good practices, uh, which is why the approach and the method behind this project is 
are very fundamental. Um, another characteristic, um, these projects define themselves by their results linked to inter interdisciplinary approaches. Um, indeed, um, the, the effectiveness of the association of amateurs in many cases um, appears to be indexed to the position of social science and humanities uh, in, the, uh, in the research projects. Um, I'll explain myself. Um, in other words, social science and humanities uh, um, can um, characterize the disciplines embodied in the projects, um, philosophy, uh, literature, uh, sociology. Uh, they can have a role in the definition of the projects issues or in the participation projects uh, process, sorry, like in the case in community-based projects, uh, for instance. And uh, I would add, they can have a role in the evaluation of the projects uh, as well. Um, they, they share the common objective to build up a society of knowledge, and it's important to measure uh, global impacts. So uh, that's been said, um, to, to better understand what we are talking about, we have the chance uh, today to have a very eclectic panel. Um, we are going to hear different points of view and the, present, uh, the presentation of different projects, uh, different by their objects, by their scale, uh, from community-based uh, based project to virtual projects, uh, different by their approach, and um, but common by their mode of action, which is about participation and, let's say, uh, social interaction, even if it's virtual. So, um, without delay, let me briefly introduce my guests in order of speaking. Uh, first of all, Thomas Karstedt. Um, sorry for my French accent. Um, your deputy library director at the University of Southern Denmark, and you're also on Libra's conference program committee, and you're active in the Citizen Science Working Group. Uh, you have worked on a number of strategic community society based projects, and you will open this roundtable by giving an introduction to citizen science and cover examples of social science and humanities case studies. Welcome to you. Uh, then uh, we'll go on with Dirk van Gorp, uh, your Open Science Manager at Radboud University, Nijmegen, <laughs> the Netherlands. Uh, sorry again for my pronunciation. And your member of Liber Citizen Science Working Group as well. Um, your team focuses on supporting researchers in the areas of data management, management sorry, open access, copyright, altmetrics. And aside from local initiative, you are involved in several national and international open access projects. And you will speak about how libraries can be the catalyst for citizen science projects. Welcome. And we'll go on with two speakers who will present two inspiring use cases. So first of all, Ad Pole from Europeana. Uh, you have a background in audiovisual archiving and international project man management, and you're a member of the community and partner engagement team. Um, Europeana transcribes aim to engage the public in transcribing, annotating, and georeferencing Europeana's vast collection of digitized items particularly on Russian materials, amassed from library, archives, and museum from all over the world, from all over, all across Europe, sorry. And uh, you will talk about one activity uh, organized by you and your team called Transcribaton. And finally, Tim Kozer, your senior researcher associate at the Faculty of Law of UCL, the London Global University. Uh, you're here to tell us about the Bentham project, uh, which aiming to produce a new scholarly edition of the works and correspondence of Jeremy Bentham. Uh, Jeremy Bentham is an English jurist, philosopher, and social scientist. Uh, the project is notably composed by a participatory initiative, Transcream Bentham, which have been launched in 2010. So um, let's go back to our first speaker uh, to begin and his experience of social science and humanities projects. Um, Thomas, I give you the floor. Thank you, Helene, and thank you for having me. And I think you have made 
a very good take on the program because I believe Dirk and myself would cover some of the background and I'm excited to hear both of the more in-depth presentations later on. So I think that was an excellent choice if I may say so. I will share my screen. Helene, can you see my screen please? Yes, we can see it, Thomas. Yeah, can see your screen, you. yeah. I am yeah. trying to get it up in a bigger size. Please hold on. So very briefly, um, I accepted this presentation uh, because I think it has a very, very fundamental thing in the emergence of citizen science that in my experience, it could be much more than what you could probably call the more traditional citizen science, uh, which comes from natural science. Um, I am trying to shift, please hold on. Uh, sorry, but I have a little bit of technical problems. There we are. Uh, just briefly, uh, I have worked within citizen science the last four years. And I think my take on this is the experience of being project manager, uh, working together with researchers and a university uh, to try to build citizen science into uh, really all kinds of uh, faculties that we have at my university. So briefly, I'm going to talk about the foundation, why, how we work with citizen science and briefly, what is citizen science? And at the end, I will cover a few cases that perhaps could be inspirational for the discussion later on. So I think, and Dirk is going to cover this uh, much more in detail in his presentation. Uh, I believe that in order to grow citizen science, although I deeply respect researchers and communities who do bottom-up citizen science, I believe that from an intra, uh, infrastructure and university standpoint, citizen science could be grown into much greater depth and within all disciplines if we have a more structural approach. So at SDU, we have a citizen science network with all five faculties. We have some seed money and we are trying to create a meaningful interaction and dialogue between citizens and researcher. And we have this very clear goal of reducing the distance between the society and researchers uh, and have a debate, public debate based on knowledge and facts. So right now we have a citizen science network and what we are really trying to achieve is to grow this into a single point of contact or a bespoke, which would be covered in Dirk's presentation. Uh, interesting point, I believe from my own university that has boosted citizen science quite a lot is that my university SDU in 2019 adopted the UN sustainability goals as part of their strategy. So working on that and building on that, uh, we had had a much easier access to get around our university and engage faculties and researchers and trying to build the UN sustainability goals into uh, our agenda. So that's very briefly that, that we have a fairly structured approach, fairly strategic approach at my university, which should be seen as the baseline for the next part. So briefly, what is citizen science? And citizen science, uh, I have stolen this presentation or this slide from Eva Mendes from uh, University of Madrid. And Eva uh, is uh, advisor to the EU Commission on Open Science. And it's just basically her take on how does citizen science fit into the open science landscape? And in Eva's interpretation, and there could be many other interpretations, uh, it's to say that the sum of all these emerging fields uh, that are reaching out within open science, citizen science could be seen as the sum or the method that are the bridgehead uh, that creates open science. And moving on a little bit, um, and Elena touched on it briefly, I had the great privilege to assist UCL libraries uh, here in 2020 to map out a citizen science strategy 
that uh, very briefly turned out to be a strategy that, that implicated much more than the library. And I believe the second point after creating a governance is that this very, very capable institution with a lot of really excellent world-class citizen science projects, and one of them are presented later on uh, in this uh, session, was a discussion, what is citizen science? Because it has a lot of conjectures Every faculty could interpret it uh, differently, but at SDU, uh, where we have uh, citizen science projects within five faculties, we have two uh, taxonomies that we use as a baseline. And briefly, the first one is by Yela Golombic and colleagues from 2017. And it's to say that inclusion and contribution and reciprocality within citizen science is considered a baseline. And in my opinion, if you take inclusion and contribution, it covers the emergence of citizen science. It contributes, it, it covers a lot of the natural science, but the reciprocality part is where I think humanistics, social science and cross-disciplinary science has a really strong opportunity uh, to engage. The other one, perhaps not unsurprisingly, is by Muki Hagley. And Muki Hagley uh, is the co-founder of the Extreme Citizen Science Unit at UCL, uh, and is considered, I believe, one of the main taxonomies within citizen science. And it's to say that when we have a dialogue with researchers and the public at SDU, quite quickly, there is a confusion and interpretation Citizen science could be this, citizen science could be that. But it's to say that when we work with this on a daily basic basis, we have quite a structured hold on what it is. And at least in this participation, there are a number of levels where you could engage citizen and work with the proper projects. And every project we do at SDU, we discuss with our researchers and our partners, what kind of citizen science are we trying to achieve here? So that's very briefly where I'm coming from and that citizen science, in my opinion, is a fairly structured, uh, a theoretical, practical approach. And I think we should keep that in mind when we discuss citizen science. And the last 11 minutes uh, would cover a few cases uh, that I would like to sort out to you. So building on that citizen science originated in the modern sense from natural science, I would like to present to you a very, really radical approach to citizen science within narrative medicine. And narrative medicine is the use and appliance of literature in uh, creating a dialogue between healthcare professionals and doctors and the public. And it's a reflection tool that are aimed at trying to get doctors not to see the patients as patients, but as whole persons that has experiences, knowledge, and input that could fit in to medical research. So what we did was we collaborated with our local university hospital, and we tried building on a curriculum course at our university in narrative medicine. We did two uh, discussion groups where we used literature for reflection. One was within healthcare professionals, the others were with citizens. We put them together with four uh, literary authors who had published uh, literary text on what it would mean to be sick or be admitted at a hospital or have your spouse had a serious illness. And we discussed this in order to see what kind of reflections, how could it be meaningful to build on this with the doctors and the healthcare professionals and how could it be meaningful, meaningful for the citizens? We published a blog that were uh, scientific data and the outcome were uh, scientific uh, peer reviewed publications in two journals. Also, we have at SDU, uh, also to say that uh, the other project was a cross disciplinary approach between humanistic and health science. Another uh, example is we have this project, Life with Dementia, and dementia is approaching as a fast 
disease uh, that has implications for the growing popularity of elderly people, at least in Denmark and probably across Europe. So this is a four faculty approach where we have uh, researchers within health science and clinicians from our university hospital. We have uh, researchers from humanistics within literature, dance and the arts. We have uh, natural science within pharmacy and we have uh, from technical uh, faculty that are interested in how data and big data and the interpretation of that from citizens could benefit dementia. So what we are trying to do is create work packages together with a number of partners from the municipalities in Denmark, where they have first line responders or treatments of people with dementia in order not to cure dementia, because apparently right now that is not possible, but try to co-collaborate collaborate and have co-created working environments, uh, citizens driven, driven uh, villages and some actual appliance of programs on how we could work and make life better for the people and the relatives with dementia. Uh, so that is a very interesting, very co-created for faculty approach that has humanistics uh, as a core element. Also, and this I think is a fairly traditional natural science project. It's within uh, environmental biology in order to monitor the water quality in lakes around Denmark. But what is interesting here, and I will touch on that at my very end of the presentation, is that we collaborate with uh, 10 uh, school classes from public schools and eight high school classes, 500 pupils and students in all. And what we're trying to do is build this fairly traditional citizen science project into the curriculum based on science literacy. And science literacy is a approach that could be used by all citizen science projects in order to grow it into cross-disciplinary research. We use this approach in a humanistic project called Our History, where we, beginning in uh, January 2021, have 10 high school classes within history that are collecting data and stories from elderly people in their families or their community. Um, then we are uploading them in a database, but there it's also part of a curriculum teaching program where these uh, high school students uh, work and evaluate on a citizen science basis how this could be used for history research. We have a lot of partners in that, but the last two projects, and this is the end of my uh, presentation, are building on the concept of science literacy. And science literacy, in my opinion, could perhaps be considered a cross-disciplinary tool that could be used in a number of citizen science projects because it creates an understanding or, an, or a method to how citizens and we use it with high school students and public school uh, pupils, how they can understand methods of inquiry that leads to scientific knowledge. And my proposition could be, and I'm very excited for the last two presentations. My proposition is this could be built into a lot of citizen science project, but it has a humanistic origin. Also, uh, if we want to achieve the uh, insertment of science and a dialogue with the public, it helps reflect from people who participate in citizen science how they can organize, analyze, and interpret quantitative but also qualitative data. And it's to say that it has conjunctures to media literacy and news literacy, which could perhaps be put into social science. It could have interpretations into environmental literacy, 
but also within health literacy and computational thinking. So there are some means and tools that could help grow citizen science in a cross-disciplinary field. And with that, I think my 15 uh, minutes are up. I would be happy to share some of the literature and research that this builds on, but otherwise, I will go back to Helene. And right now, please thank you for having me at this point. Thank you, Thomas, uh, for this complete overview and this perfect entry into the, the heart of the matter. Uh, we'll go on with Dirk van Gogh, who is going to speak about the role of the liber librarians. So, Dirk, please. Right, so first, I'm mute. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, very good. So I'm going to open, share and open my presentation. Let's see. This is the one. Looks great. There we go. Yeah, now it's it's an actual presentation instead of a screen. Uh, right. So um, once again, thank you uh, for having me um, on this this uh, meeting. Uh, I am Dirk van Gorp. I am the Open Science Manager at the Rappert University, which is in Nijmegen, the city of Nijmegen in the Netherlands. And um, we are have been working for the past few years on creating uh, and proper, properly establishing an open science team within our university. Um, I'm not necessarily involved in actual citizen science projects myself. Um, the point of view I'm going to take in this presentation is uh, to see how we as a librarians or at the very least as supporting staff can help researchers as well as citizens um, in conducting citizen science by creation of a single point of contact. So uh, the title of my presentation, hence the title of my presentation, the academic library as a single point of contact. So uh, we are go I'm going to focus in this presentation on the BSPOC, the uh, broad, en broad engagement in science point of contact. Uh, basically the same as a single point of contact for, uh, well, in this terminology, it's, it's focusing also on open science in general. Um, but in uh, our presentation, we're going to look at a citizen science single point of contact. Uh, the term BSPOC is not my own. It's actually a term uh, created or, um, uh, let's say, cre yeah, created is, an, is the correct word, I think, by our uh, liberal work group colleagues, uh, Tiberius Ignat and Paul Aries from UCL. Uh, they have uh, written an article in the UK, UKSG some time ago in which they uh, basically coined this term for the first time. So a single point of contact for citizen science potentially, not necessarily, but potentially comprises several uh, aspects for several factors. It can be an online hub or a website or both. Uh, wait, I'm going to close this one. Uh, to share institutional goals or policies, to highlight citizen science projects, of course, very important. Uh, to provide templates for citizen science skills, tasks, frameworks for partnerships, et cetera, et cetera. It can also comprise a service desk uh, to be an actual point of contact, a location where people can actually go to if they have any questions about citizen science or if they would like some assistance with citizen science. And if they don't know uh, where to uh, go to, then a service desk can be an actual point of contact which people can contact. Um, and of course, to answer questions, but perhaps also important, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail later on, to either act as a liaison or an intermediate between several various uh, services within a university, or perhaps even to uh, provide these services themselves. It has to be a tool for communication and marketing uh, on the one hand to reach out towards uh, researchers as well as towards citizens, but also for the citizens that are, uh, are cooperating, collaborating within citizen science projects to stay in touch, to um, facilitate communication between researchers and citizens, citizens who are participating. And of course, um, once again, this depends on whether you'd like to be a, a point of contact that also um, actually provides services themselves. It can also be a pool of knowledge and expertise to help uh, citizens and researchers out with any issues they have regarding uh, citizen science. Uh, and that can be uh, very broad, broadly speaking, focusing on um, basic things like uh, providing templates to uh, share those templates to perhaps facilitate communication between uh, different parties, 
but it could also be to actually help gathering data, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, a pool of knowledge and expertise can be uh, very broad. In a bespoke, we are, folk, we are having uh, several main players. Uh, of course, the target audience, the scientists and the citizens. Uh, there are also, of course, uh, other parties involved, uh, the media, um, NGOs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the most important players within this, this say, within this landscape uh, are, of course, the scientists and the citizens themselves. But for us as a, at a university library, uh, we also need to take into account the research support staff, um, support staff that is focusing already on the GDPR issues, on uh, research data management, on open access, but other things as well. Uh, support staff focusing on communication, uh, on finance, on stuff like legal matters, which may be very important depending on what sort of bespoke you as a university or as a library would like to create. And perhaps there might be other supporting staff that uh, might be of, of use of, or of importance for you as a university as well. Uh, I myself, I'm an open science manager and I am operating from within our university library. Um, the academic library has, has seen a lot of changes in the past uh, several decades. At first, uh, we were mostly focusing on storage, search and find the traditional, um, let's say the traditional tasks of, a lab, of an academic library. But slowly uh, for the past decades, we are uh, moving towards uh, first open access and then uh, towards research data management, which is in many universities at the moment, a very important part of uh, academic library services. Uh, open access as well, of course. And now we are also slowly moving, some university libraries are also slowly moving towards other, um, let's say, open science topics, including uh, open educational resources, uh, peer review, metrics, open source, but of, uh, also, of course, citizen science. And uh, we, as a, at the University Library of Nijmegen, we're going to take a look, we are trying to take a look at if we can incorporate citizen science within our already existing uh, services, uh, and if not, uh, to see if we should create a single point of contact that also encompasses additional services located outside of our open science team. Um, we have our own open science support hub. Uh, a support hub can consist of many, many uh, varying topics, um, usually combines already existing teams like an open access team, like a data management team, copyright, GDPR, uh, stuff like that. And uh, we are now seeing in several universities an increased focus on not necessarily the open, access, the open science aspect of research, but more a focus on research life cycle elements. And they are trying to incorporate open science within, a focus, uh, within the focus on the research life cycle itself. So we're not necessarily taking a look at uh, what do we need to provide and what sort of assistance do we need to provide in terms of open science, but what sort of assistance do we need to provide to researchers in general? And uh, certain aspects of open science will come into, uh, into play here, of course, but it's not the only important form of services we like to, uh, we like to provide. An open science support hub can act as a support hub uh, with a website or a portal. Uh, it has a service desk. It provides trainings and workshops, etc. And it also um, allows for the maintenance for, of infra infrastructure and tools, for example, uh, CRIS registration uh, tools like that. And they also uh, conduct or participate in projects, initiate projects regarding open uh, open science and it can also be involved in citizen science project as well of course if you like thomas if you'd like to uh, be such a a support hub a, the b spot at the library the pros and cons because a library doesn't necessarily has to be the main focal point of a b spot the pros one of the pros it's uh, an independent of department so it's it provides services independent of uh, whatever uh, venue, whatever whatever view a faculty is taking, on the one hand. Uh, it services all departments. It's not just for the health sciences or the nature sciences or the, the humanities. It's for everyone. Uh, it already it already usually has already existing support teams, um, like the open science uh, team I, was, I, I spoke about earlier. And it has it already often has a social role within the academic communities. Um, sometimes, not always, sometimes with a link to uh, public libraries as well. And this link can be very important because a public library uh, can also be a, 
let's say an important venue for citizens to uh, to to come across citizen science in science in general, citizen science uh, more specifically. But there are also cons. Uh, perhaps some university libraries don't have a an open science or a similar team. Uh, they may not have uh, related goals, and they uh, often uh, a problem for many universities. They don't have the capacity to actually uh, to actually create an open science team to to put in the the necessary effort and time to uh, to 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 help out with citizen science. Um, an important con is also the traditional image of a library. For many researchers and perhaps also citizens, a library is usually still a place where people can get books and uh, and books and, and magazines or, or journals. And so many people won't, um, when you when think of citizen science, they don't necessarily think of a university library. They often think of, say, more faculty-related services. So perhaps, uh, creating a BSPOC in a library might not be the best thing to do. It's something we already, we also encounter, encounter within, the, uh, within open science. Um, if people have questions, researchers have questions about open science, it's often that they don't know where to turn to. And uh, even though we as a university library are trying to communicate our open science services as much as possible. And there might also be competing or parallel services within the universities and or different departments or faculties, uh, which may be a more suitable candidate to, uh, to be the location where a BSPOC is based on uh, or is, is being created. Uh, the strategic, we are working within the Libra Workgroup Citizen Science on uh, several strategic, strategic directions. Uh, one of these directions uh, as these is a creation of a single point of contact. Uh, the goal of this strategic direction is to create, uh, to deliver a template or a suite of templates with accompanying advocacy for a single citizen science contact point that could, but not necessarily should be implemented in research libraries. Uh, important components of this uh, single point of contact uh, are of course, uh, the, to define a proper goal and a scope, which will be a very important part of the creation of a point of contact, uh, what sort of um, sorry, what sort of uh, uh, things are actually being, are actually citizen science and what uh, would you like to leave out of your scope? Uh, it should be for both researchers and citizens, or perhaps you'd like to focus more on researchers or on the one hand or citizens on the other. It, it's, a, it's a choice you can make. Um, cooperation between divisions and services is very important, of course. Uh, the service desk function I mentioned uh, before, uh, being able to actually contact something, someone, if you have any questions, is very important. And it can also include, but not necessarily should, courses for citizen science skills and train the trainer courses. Um, the deliverables we're trying to, to focus on in this strategic direction is uh, the creation of a, a BSPOC. These are the, the four main deliverables. Uh, the creation of a BSPOC at a university, uh, how to do so, how to create a BSPOC, uh, providing templates for people who like to create a BSPOC at their own university. On the one hand, um, then uh, there's also the creation of a portal, a website and online service desk setup. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the usual uh, suspects, the content templates, um, templates for data management, for uh, well, uh, data collection, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in addition, if you'd like to include courses as well, the courses. Creation of a BSPOC, a goal and scope. Uh, an important question you need to ask yourself if you are uh, going to create a BSPOC is what sort of BSPOC do you want to be? Uh, you can be on the one hand an intermediary, uh, which acts basically as a forwarding services service. Um, this doesn't necessarily take up a lot of energy and a lot of time. Uh, what you do within, in, uh, within the terms of an intermediary role, you basically uh, forward questions towards the relevant services which are already in existence within the university. For example, if you have a question, uh, we receive a question about a legal matter, you forward the question towards legal and legal, legal, the legal department can then take care of this question or answer the question or whatever. Um, but this is a very, if, if you are going to act as an intermediary, you need to make sure that the rights and responsibilities of all uh, players involved are um, properly fixed are all, all very clear, clear to all parties involved because otherwise, well, um, someone can, can forward a question to legal, but if legal doesn't answer, then you have a problem and you don't, act, you don't really act as a beast bug. You're simply acting as, as some, someone who forwards something and then leaves it at that. 
But it can also, of course, be an independent service, which includes um, services in uh, regarding governance, regarding legal back backing, which has its own, let's say, uh, legal expert, its own finance expert, its own data collection expert. Uh, it's all, uh, it it's all depends on whatever sort of BSPAC you'd like to be. Um, is, uh, the additional questions you'd like to focus on, uh, would you like to focus on citizens and or scientists? Would you like to cater to the needs of uh, scientists foremost and citizens second? Or perhaps you'd like to focus on both? It's something uh, you should also take into account when, creation, when creating a BSPOC. And uh, something for us as a library service, um, should it, does it need to be library driven or uh, can the library participate but not be the main player within the creation of a BSPOC and the actual uh, uh, running of a single point of contact? Uh, some of the deliverables uh, that, is, that are, are uh, um, uh, necessary for the creation of a BSPOC, uh, set up templates. Uh, these include, for example, but this, this, this is just a, a these, these are just a few examples, not necessarily a, uh, a full list. Uh, these include action plans to formally create BSPOC within a university, uh, formats for, for cooperation with, with the legal departments, uh, for cooperation with the faculties, cooperation with copyright information services, marketing communication, etc., etc. Data management, of course, and the financial departments. These are the major ones we uh, have identified, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there are and that there aren't any others. So this is also this would also depend on what what sort of university university you are and what sort of BSPOC you'd like to be. Uh, another important deliverable, of course, is the portal, which uh, acts on the one hand as a service desk to uh, for people to actually contact, for people to reach out to, uh, forwarding they can forward the the questions and issues people uh, come to to uh, come to come with towards the relevant services and context. Of course, this is more important when you act as an intermediary instead of an actual uh, single point of contact with their own related services themselves. Um, and they provide basic communication or full communications. Um, they uh, check and answer emails, they share news. news. And if uh, you create a, a, let's say, a larger um, BSPOC, a larger single point of, point of contact that also includes services, then this communication part would also include things like um, maintaining communication between scientists and uh, citizens, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is the, the, the service desk points I have written down here are mostly for the, it's mostly the low hanging fruit. Um, this is what you can do fairly easy, the forwarding part, the basic communication. You don't need uh, several employees to take care of such, such tasks. Only one or a few might suffice. Uh, and of course, also the website function, uh, providing basic info on citizen science and uh, the BSPOC, the single point of contact. Uh, the website can share best practices, can share all relevant or uh, the most important citizen science projects within a university. And it should have, of course, a contact page, otherwise people won't be able to reach them. Uh, this is an example of a, a humanities citizen science project within our own universities. It's, it focuses on the uh, Sur Suriname, uh, Suriname, I'm not sure what the English version is of, of Suriname is. Um, anyway, on, on the, the slave registers of one of the former colonies of the, in the Netherlands. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the examples uh, which, which um, showed how important a proper portal is. Uh, the the uh, scientists behind this, this uh, citizen science project were using the, their own website and their own uh, forms of communication, their own portals extensively to, uh, to, to gather uh, sufficient data to, uh, to reach out to citizens and to also inform citizens about their own project. And some additional deliverables regarding content templates and courses. These are the, uh, let's say, the, the things people think about most when they think about a citizen science uh, single uh, point of contact or citizen science services. Uh, is providing templates on data gathering, data creation, uh, approaching interested parties or citizens, uh, focusing on ethics, legal matters, uh, checklists, funding opportunities, crowdfunding, et cetera, et cetera. All those templates should be included uh, within a BSPOC, in my opinion. Um, and it can also perhaps uh, provide templates for, uh, for example, uh, tools or apps, uh, criteria for the creation of tool or apps. Uh, these might also be included on a BSPOC website. 
And finally, if you uh, want to be a BSPOC, which actually also provides uh, information uh, for their, their uh, own researchers or actually their own, their own uh, trainers, their own uh, service personnel, then you could also include information on uh, citizen science skills courses for, um, uh, it's, it's basically a trainer trainer course with which you can educate researchers and citizens about how to participate in citizen science, how to conduct a citizen science project, uh, how to help out in citizen science project. Uh, these are, are things you, uh, of course, this takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. So uh, this is only really of, of relevance for the, let's say, the more, the more grander, the more grand um, beast box, the, the, the beast box that actually also include uh, quite a lot of personnel and also would like to be a pool of, of expertise and knowledge and not just the intermediary forwarding station. So uh, to summarize, uh, a single yes, point of contact. You. Yep, so almost ready. A single point of contact mm -hmm. for citizen science. Uh, there are as many different beast box as there are institutions. Uh, but the library is not always the best solution. Uh, if the library will act as a beast buck, make use of existing open science teams or hubs. Uh, no matter what sort of beast buck you want to be, a corporation is key and every university is different. Use those templates and examples that suit your institution. Uh, if you'd like to comp contribute, you can contact us, uh, either me or one of my uh, work group colleagues. And uh, that's it from my end. Thank you very much, Dirk. It was very practical and um, your intervention shows how the role of librarians is growing in citizen science, citizen science and purchase. Um, thank you. Uh, let us now focus on two interesting and relevant cases in different scientific fields relating to uh, culture. Uh, had, had Paulet and the Transcript Laton, the floor is yours. trying to unmute. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you. There it is. Um, sorry. My name is uh, Art Polet. I work for Europeana, and I wish I had all the knowledge and the models that were just described by Thomas and Dirk, because that would, saved us, uh, would have saved us a lot of time and effort. <laughs> But at the time uh, we wanted to do this, and I would like to tell you the story about how Europeana transcribe and or transcribathon came into being. I would like to do that in three ways. I would like to first of for everybody who is not familiar with Europeana explain a little bit about Europeana because that's also relevant for this initiative. And I would like to say something about other crowdsourcing initiatives that we did for Europeana that led to the development of the transcribathon tool. So basically, um, Europeana is, uh, in short, uh, Europe's platform for digital cultural heritage in the broadest sense. We give access to the digitized cultural heritage of European institutions, libraries, museums, galleries, uh, and archives. And uh, we do that since uh, 28, because that's when our prototype started. But it all started actually with libraries, because uh, in 2005, uh, President Jacques Chirac from France and his uh, fellow statesman from Europe uh, addressed uh, or took the initiative to have a some kind of an answer to Google as they originally uh, thought of it that we would make a, an effort to uh, make the, the cultural heritage of Europe uh, accessible in a digital way so it actually started a long time ago already since then Europeana developed a lot at the time that we launched we gave access to uh, a little bit over four million digital objects but um, um, now uh, today it's over 50 million so not only the content is growing, but also the knowledge around it and the network that we do that with. with. Three um, values are very important in the work that we carry out. Uh, we think that digital also means usable, so it should be accessible for everybody, but it should be accessible in a clear way. And also the material that's provided online should be reusable so that people can use it for education, for research, or for other even commercial uh, purposes. Furthermore, the work for Europeana does and their partners should be reliable, um, trustworthy, and it should, of course, also be uh, mutual so that we can not only give, but also uh, take and the other way around. 
So we do that not only by ourselves. We have uh, three types of networks, if I may say so. We do it with a lot of uh, other people. Basically, the European Foundation is based in the Royal Library of the Netherlands, the Koninklijke Bibliotheek, on the same floor, by the way, as the Liber organization is on the fifth floor. Uh, we are now uh, almost uh, over 60 people who are doing this, and we come from various uh, European countries. And uh, yeah, that's what we need we have developers we have uh, people who write editorials uh, we have people who deal with network foundations and that kind of thing so it's a, a great variety of people who are doing this one important aspect of europeana is the network association which now currently uh, holds holds uh, more than 3000 members which is a very demo uh, democratic uh, community that helps europeana foundation focus on certain certain things uh, they're experts on a personal level, they may represent organizations, but they're experts on all the kinds of things that Europeana needs in order to um, make the digital transformation possible. So that can be from uh, the legal aspect, that can be around impact uh, assessment, um, communication, uh, and also technical uh, uh, issues. And last but certainly not least, because these are the people who actually deliver the data to Europeana, uh, we have we deal with aggregators uh, who provide who work together with partners in countries or in a thematic way uh, to bring the content online to Europeana um, in a structured way. So we have uh, 38 accredited uh, aggregators. Like I said, they can be national, but they also can be uh, thematic. Like for instance, for audiovisual material, we have the EU Screen Platform and Community, and we have European Film Gateway. And so there are, for every expertise or for every nature of material, we have these people who guide the process uh, of delivering data to Europeana. Um, we're funded by the European Commission, of course, but we also relate to uh, some kind of a, a hub for uh, all kinds of activities. So we deal with a lot of um, uh, project infrastructures in, within the European Communion. Uh, the first one, the main important one, is the digital infrastructure. Uh, that Europeana is part of, uh, but it, apart from that, there are um, uh, so-called generic services projects who deal with a certain kind of topic and bring together um, archives, museums, and galleries from all over Europe on a certain topic to deliver data or to improve some kind of tool or, or develop a tool that's necessary in the whole process of the digital transformation. And of course, there's the Horizon 2020, which has come to an end now, but there will be follow-up projects uh, for innovation and for research. So, like I said, we work with a lot of partners all over Europe, um, and the most active ones are actually the libraries, maybe because they started first with doing their um, digitization processes, um, but we also work with private partners, uh, commercial partners even, everybody who has an interest in delivering data in a certain way and um, yeah, try to improve that process. But the core product, of course, of Europeana is uh, its collection site where we give actually the access to these 54 million uh, types of objects. They can be very different in, in, in nature. Like I said, they can be pictures, they can be uh, photographs, um, paintings, but also text documents uh, and even um, video. So there's a lot and we try to make that accessible, but also digestible in a certain way. So we um, spend a lot of time and effort together with our partners who have knowledge about all those products um, to make this engaging as possible as engaging as possible so we uh, we, uh, we share stories uh, like blogs but also galleries and exhibitions uh, on, a, on a variety of subjects that can be like history social history of fashion uh, architecture or even the environment um, <clears throat> and of course we try to make this all uh, as much as possible available uh, to people who need these kind of resources and would like to have uh, access to those resources for instance in an educational setting so we also prepare uh, specific data sets learning scenarios in different languages and we provide tools for teachers to make use of the material on europeana so that they can use it in their classroom there is actually an initiative called europeana classroom uh, where people can find uh, yeah data sets related to a certain topic that they can use in their, in their curriculum. And last but not least, I forgot, I just mentioned that we also uh, make sure that we can make use of our um, data for uh, apps uh, and games. 
together with um, the industry, the creative industry for that. So basically what uh, the Europeana Collection site tells is the story of Europe uh, in all its varieties. Um, so people who would normally not have the means or the time to, to, to travel to all those institutions themselves, they can now find large parts of their collections in high quality telling that story of Europe. But it doesn't stop there because we think that um, not only the institutions hold a valuable uh, amount of, of uh, European heritage, also the people at home do so, and they certainly do have knowledge about it. So this is why we organize initiatives, um, crowdsourcing initiatives, in which we try to involve the, the average European, if I may say so, as much as possible, uh, to bring them into connection with those collections and help further build those collections. And a couple of uh, examples I would like to mention in the second part of my, um, oh, sorry, I forgot that. Um, so we, we ask them uh, to contribute, to actively contribute and to relate to those, uh, to those objects. Of course, the core of everything is the Europeana data model, which allows all those items and the metadata there that come with them to bring them uh, along and to make them um, connected to other items. So there is a, the European data model makes it possible so that every institution can deliver a certain uh, amount of data so that it can be connected to other ones, uh, regardless of the origin or the type of object. And you can imagine that's a huge task in itself to make sure that uh, an archive in uh, Prague can uh, connect its items to a museum in Paris uh, and then also further connect to uh, a gallery in Spain which has a, a, a painting about the same topic for instance. Um, so it requires a lot of um, yeah, negotiation in a way but also a lot of um, uh, development uh, of data fields and to try to connect them as much as possible. So the European data model is an ongoing, ongoing work. But as I said we also um, do this for the benefit of all those institutions because bringing your objects online with data is one thing but I think or we think that um, this can be brought to a higher level by enriching not only connecting it but also enriching the metadata so we have initiatives going to do that in an automatic way um, and to make sure that uh, everything is located or um, linked to a location in Europe as much as possible we do this like I said in an automatic way but we also ask the general public for help for that with that so um, um, this is why we developed these uh, pan-European initiatives that you've seen previously in a slide um, and I would like to highlight two of them specifically one of them is called Europeana 1940-1918 which dealt with uh, you might have guessed it with the period around the First World War, uh, but not from a military perspective or not strictly military perspective, but from a human perspective. And uh, we did a similar effort around the political events in 1989 in Middle and Central Europe. Basically, what we did is we went all over Europe together with our partners, uh, which I must admit, nine out of 10 times were libraries uh, somewhere with a local uh, affiliation with a local community somewhere in Europe. So from uh, Nicosia to Dublin and from uh, Lisbon to Riga, we've been all over Europe organizing these kind of events. Events, we call them collection days, where we invited the people to come and bring the objects that they had from their homes, from their grandfathers who may have served in the war or even their grandmothers who, who did something else in the war. Um, and we brought, we asked them to bring that object. It would be digitized on the spot and we would listen to their story and also publish the story along with the object. And some fascinating things came around. For instance, that Bible that you hear, see, see uh, on top of this image that was actually brought in Germany uh, by, um, by the, the relatives of the descendants, I must say, from a, a, U, a German um, army officer who was sleeping while uh, a projectile uh, entered the room and this is a grenade, a uh, piece of grenade uh, shrapnel uh, that saved his life because he was lying uh, asleep with his head on the Bible. So the, the, the piece of shrapnel entered the Bible and saved us his life. Um, so you can imagine this is of great importance uh, of the whole family. So they, 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 they treat this as a, as a relic, as a very important object for the family history. But it also tells a story about the, about the war in Europe in general. So um, lots of objects like this were brought in, but also uh, lots of documents. And this was actually the reason why we thought, okay, we have to disclose these kind of materials because they're not in a museum. There's not uh, any professional care being taken with these things. 
again, we were only digitizing the objects. We were not uh, asking them to store them. I mean, of course, sometimes museums were uh, connected to the event and then they would offer that opportunity if they were interested in the object. But nine out of 10 times, the object would go home with the people. But nevertheless, um, some of the objects were very interesting uh, documentations of what went on in the war in a specific area. So, uh, and we, we now have them available. The only thing is we cannot read them. Uh, not by machine reading, but also we cannot translate them, so we cannot offer it, uh, make it more accessible. So this is why we thought of the initiative of Transcribeathon to uh, set up some kind of tool by making use of the crowd again to make sure that we can uh, make those documents more accessible for research, but also for personal interest. So one of the first things that we started to do was uh, try to uh, solve the problems with machine reading. So we um, organized one of the first transcribathons around the theme of newspapers that was done again in the library in Berlin this time, Staatsbibliothek zu Berlin. And there we um, uh, organized a conference and a transcribathon event where students and people from the general public um, could spend on linking certain events on our website and even um, objects on our website related to the First World War to uh, newspaper items. And in fact, for instance, this picture of this story reading uh, the Berliner Tageblatt, we could actually trace it back to the original edition, which was already digitized by the Staatsbibliothek. So we could make a perfect connection between the two. And we were also able to read actually the page that the soldier is also reading. Um, we did a similar Adam, initiative. Adam, Sorry, sorry. <laughs> the time flies very quickly. Um, oh. Yeah, sorry. Um, we are, we have um, uh, one project last. So, um, can you just tell us about the project in two minutes, please? Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I didn't know time. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I, when you present the screen, you don't have, you see you don't see the time. So I was unaware of that. Yes. So basically, that's why we uh, build up Transcribathon. Um, it's a platform and a tool where you can have. Uh, access to those very kinds of docu uh, various do kinds of documents you can read them yourselves and try to um, to transcribe them we organize events to do that together with partners we do online runs we do uh, specific themes where you can win prizes around the, the theme of Versailles, for instance and um, we have physical events where people actually come together in a room and transcribe documents together I will skip this one. It's a very nice document, but I will tell it when we later have time. So the process is basically you register, you find yourself a document, uh, you start a transcription, um, you make description of the object that you are working on. Uh, you can add locations. You can also tag other types of things related to, for instance, other people or other uh, topics or uh, even other um, objects. Um, and then you open it and you close it for a review. Uh, this is the registration. Sorry, I have to rush through it. Um, you can also find uh, things on a map. Um, you can format the text uh, within it. You can zoom in so that you can have a closer look at uh, things. You can uh, change the size or the shape of the object a little bit so that you can uh, disclose it uh, more easily. Like I said, you can tag the documents uh, with people, certain keywords, uh, or even a date document. And then there are four stages. Uh, gray is a document which is, has not been started. Uh, you can look at the yellow one to uh, start working and editing it. Uh, and then it's orange for review. And once the review has been completed, it's green. So it's very simple. Like I said, it's very engaging also for the people. So it's uh, about uh, winning prizes and uh, making um, uh, progress. And this progress is also kept in the on the side, so you can actually track who's leading and how many work you have to do until you have uh, become the first one in line. There are um, certificates. Um, uh, there are prizes to win. I would like to explore a little bit more about, uh, explain a little bit more about events, but unfortunately there's no time for it. In the future, and this is one element that I would like to mention, is that we do uh, impact assessments of all these events, because this is a relevance that we do not only for the audience, but also for institutions. So we uh, assess the impact of all these events, and the outcome is really extraordinary. People love, love to engage with historical objects in this way, and they do it in a very nice way. We aim to work together with the uh, more academic uh, tool Transcribos in the future. Uh, and there's the ARMA project, which I would like to mention here, that we, re we will soon start uh, something around um, um, documents from the Middle Ages, which is a very uh, uh, challenge to, uh, to work with because it's very difficult and not very well known with the uh, general public, but they will then certainly learn from it. 
I'm sorry for rushing this. Um, I hope my presentation can be available in some other way and we come to the questions later. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so I'm so sorry I rushed you. No problem. It's my, <laughs> my own fault. Very interesting. And uh, so uh, thank you very much. And um, yes, uh, Tim, please. I think you muted, Tim. If you can unmute yourself. Yep. There we go. Right. Try again. Thanks. There we go. Excellent. Um, thank you again for, for having me and to Ellen for chairing this. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about our uh, Transcribe Bentham project, which launched in September 2010, and that it's still going strong, I find um, doubly remarkable. First, because digital humanities projects are often quite transitory, owing to um, short term funding, and because we uh, in the second instance, Transcribe Bentham was an experiment which we had no idea would work. So I thought I'd like to quickly run through um, why and how we established Transcribe Bentham and then some of Transcribe Bentham's results and whether or not crowdsourced transcription is a worthwhile investment of resources. Um, Transcribe Bentham is coordinated by the Bentham Project, which was founded at UCL in 1958 to produce the new critical edition of the collected works of Jeremy Bentham, the philosopher born in London in 1748 and who died in 1832. Bentham is probably best known for two things. First, for his Panoptic and Penitentiary scheme, as you can see here, or perhaps rather Michel Foucault's adaptation of it as a metaphor for the kind of surveillance imposed by modern liberal societies upon their citizens. Um, Bentham imagined the Panopticon as a humane and efficient prison. It was to have consisted of a central inspection tower with the prison cells around the outer walls. Um, and the prisoners would be able to see the prison inspector who was in the tower. So they'd have to assume they were being watched at all times, which Bentham thought would lead them to modifying their behavior and acquiring a taste for honest work. Um, Bentham spent a decade trying to persuade the British government to build a Panopticon and despite having two pieces of legislation to authorize it, it was, it was never built. The second thing is Bentham's auto icon or self image. Um, he requested in his will that his body be dissected for the benefit of medical science and to encourage others to do the same. He also requested that his skeleton then be reassembled, dressed in his, dressed in his own clothes. And as he put it, seated in a chair, usually occupied by me when living in the attitude in which I am sitting when engaged in thought. And in 1850, the auto icon came to UCL and it has now been on public, dis public display for several decades. <clears throat> the Panopticon and the auto icon tend, however, I think to obscure Bentham's wider importance. Um, his thought and works have had a major historical impact and are still of, of great significance. He was the founder of the modern doctrine of utilitarianism. That is that an action is right if it increases happiness as a critical standard by which to judge laws, institutions, and practices. Bentham advocated female suffrage, was a proponent of sexual liberty, and wrote on topics um, as varied as natural rights, punishment and reform of criminals, political economy, religion, and was a theorist of representative democracy. Um, he's also responsible for coining several everyday words, international, minimize, and maximize all originate with, with Bentham. Um, Antagentacular circumgyration, that is going for a pre-breakfast jog, um, has surprisingly not fallen into common usage. However, the, um, the new edition of Bentham's collected works is based on those he published in his lifetime, as well as those which exist only in manuscript. And producing the edition, as you can see from the slide there, can seem quite a Sisyphean task. Um, to date, 34 of a projected 80 volumes have been published and about 50,000 of the 100,000 or so pages of um, manuscript written and composed by Bentham held by UCL and the British Library um, have actually been transcribed. So in other words, our understanding of the full range and depth of the thought of one of the great philosophers is incomplete and in many respects um, provisional, which is where transcribed Bentham came in. Excuse me. 
when it launched around about 20, 28,000 pages of manuscript had been transcribed and we sought to answer three questions. Could volunteers decipher and transcribe Bentham's manuscripts? Could volunteers identify and encode in text encoding initiative compliant XML, the structural, spatial, organizational and compositional features of the manuscripts and TEI being a, a de facto standard for the online presentation of texts? And would volunteer transcripts be suitable uh, would be of sufficient quality for use in preparing the collected works and for uploading to UCL Libraries digital repository. Um, even now, 10 years later, and after the launch of so many crowdsourcing projects in the last decade, I do think that Transcribe Bentham still remains almost uniquely demanding in that participants are doing these two very um, challenging interconnected tasks, that is transcribing a page at a time complex 18th and 19th century manuscripts and encoding this stuff in text encoding um, initiative compliant XML. Transcribed Bentham volunteers have more than risen to the challenge. However, what you see here are examples of manuscripts which have been transcribed to a very high standard by um, volunteer transcribers, all with varying degrees of complexity. No page is ever the same as the last. Um, they're dealing with Bentham's notoriously difficult handwriting, um, his challenging ideas and idiosyncratic style. And one volunteer even transcribed this abomination, which I uh, was never brave enough to, to have a go at. The transcripts serve two main purposes. And as I mentioned, they're uploaded to the UCL Digital Bentham Papers Repository alongside their respective images to create a searchable database of Bentham's papers and draft transcripts are now used as a starting point by editors of collected works volumes. So it's very much embedded in our editorial process. Um, for the sake of time, I'll skip over um, that. Um, in practice, the, in the Transcribe Bentham transcription desk, the volunteer will be presented with a plain text transcription and a toolbar. The toolbar was developed to be able to add the XML markup um, to the transcript at the touch of a button because we recognize that people may not necessarily um, know um, or have experience of, of um, markup um, before taking part. To run through a few of our results, as of the 30th of October this year, Transcribe Bentham volunteers have transcribed or partially transcribed 25,000 697 pages, which is about 10 million words. Um, over the lifetime of the project, that's an average of about 47 transcripts a week. Although, as you can see here in this on this chart, um, participation rates fluctuate, and I think there's a few instant um, landmarks worth remarking upon. Um, probably the key one being from about October to December 2010, it looked like Transcribe Bentham might well fail. Um, there were some weeks we were getting only seven or eight transcripts a week. Um, an article about Transcribe Bentham appeared in the New York Times just after Christmas 2010, and the user base then trebled, and it took a couple of weeks to catch up on submissions. Um, and that really gave the project a momentum and a profile on which we were able to build and maintain more or less uh, ever since. The greatest rate of participation came round about March, April 2014 until March 2015. Um, <clears throat> during this period, volunteers were producing an average of over 100 transcripts per week, nearly 200 a week during May 2014. And this was owing to us making available for the first time Bentham's personal correspondence, which was held in the British Library, um, as well as an improved uh, transcription interface. Um, like many crowdsourcing projects, the majority of the work for Transcribe Bentham has been done by a minority of users. Again, as of the end of October this year, 772 volunteers had worked on at least one transcript, though around two thirds of that number had only worked on one, indicating that the task was either too difficult or appeared too difficult for many who might otherwise have been prepared to have gotten involved or more involved. Most of the work for Transcribe Bentham has been done by these 35 super transcribers um, and those who have participated in the last 12 months are, are highlighted in blue. 10 volunteers have transcribed over a thousand manuscripts each, including one who has worked on over um, 5,000. 
Um, in other words, those super transcribers comprise about 5% of all registered volunteers who have participated. They have worked on 97% of all transcripts and one user alone has worked on only about 20% on 20% of all transcripts. So in that sense, um, Transcribe Bentham may not be crowdsourcing in the purest sense and might be better termed crowd sifting, uh, a term coined by my former colleague, Professor Melissa Terrace. That is, you issue a, the, the traditional open call to as wide a group as possible, and then encourage the emergence of a self-selecting smaller group of individuals with the skills, desire, and time to, to regularly participate. And the importance of supporting volunteers cannot be overstated. Um, evidently, if even one of our most active participants ceased transcribing, then the particip participation rate would collapse. So there's a, a need to support existing super transcribers um, while making trans, um, participation attractive and straightforward enough for newcomers to um, who might then become super transcribers themselves. So and we ensure that volunteers are properly recognized the, through the, the detailed checking process and feedback given uh, to to volunteers, a leaderboard, and credits in volumes of the uh, collected works. And this is an extract from our acknowledgement to a forthcoming volume of Bentham's writings on Australia. Um, when I've spoken about transcribed Bentham over the years, two very reasonable questions are almost certain to be asked. Um, are volunteer transcripts of a high enough standard for forming the basis of scholarly work? And would the time and money required to produce the platform, recruit and manage volunteers, and check submissions not be better off invested in employing someone to just do the job themselves. From October 2012 to September 2014, Transcribe Bentham was funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to answer those questions and we measured the quality of submissions in enormous detail. Um, this was covered in one of our recent publications and I've, I've no time to go into it here, save for a few uh, headline figures in that we checked and approved 4,363 transcripts during this period. We spent 309 hours or 41.2 working days checking them. And the quality of submissions was extraordinary. Um, on average, a transcript needed only three alterations to its text and five to its markup before it was accepted uh, and, took, and took an average of three minutes and 27 seconds to check. Um, the improved iteration of the transcription desk introduced in uh, June 2013 helped eliminate large numbers of markup errors, um, as you can see here in the um, in the graph. The the ones requiring 15 or more uh, changes to the markup before we could accept them, the number of these was vastly reduced, and this is especially important because we found during the checking process that correcting the TEI markup actually took much longer than checking the transcript itself. Um, connected to this increased efficiency of the checking process is significant cost avoidance potential. And we estimated in September 2014 when around 60,000 pages of the manuscript still required transcription that to employ a researcher to do the job, it would cost about 1.1 million pounds, including um, indirect costs and no funding body would, it would ever give that amount of money to, to do just, just transcription. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, instead, um, if all the remaining uh, pages were transcribed by volunteers and then checked by transcribed Bentham staff, we calculated that the Bentham project could avoid in the long term costs of over £1 million. And although we have to take into account in that calculation the £600,000 or so invested in transcribed Bentham by the HRC, and the Mellon Foundation to develop a platform, begin and complete a massive digitization program and to pay salaries, there will still be ongoing cost avoidance built into this, um, which is especially important for the Bentham project as we rely upon competitive grants to fund our editorial work. So for instance, in producing our edition of Bentham's writings on Australia and the transportation of criminals there, we estimate that having available draft transcripts for around 60% of the several hundred pages of manuscripts um, required to do that editorial work saved about six months of my time, which would otherwise have been spent locating and transcribed them. So um, we think that Transcribe Bentham has demonstrated the potential benefits of embedding crowdsourced transcription 
into a major scholarly project and of engaging the public with cultural heritage and the work of the Benton project, for instance, has never had a, a higher profile. Of course, it's not necessarily a cheap and easy solution. Resources and staff time are required up front and on an ongoing basis to develop a platform or to customize a, um, a generic platform to improve that platform in the light of user feedback, to establish and promote a project, digitize material, support and manage volunteers, check submissions and so on. And it's very, and it's likely that the investment will really only pay off in the long term. And I think, and also crowdsourcing should only be done for a clearly articulated reason and uh, with an end use in sight for, for the outputs. Um, the day when the entire collection um, of the Bentham papers is transcribed may also come much sooner thanks to Transcribe Bentham. If it had never existed, we estimate that the earliest, the remainder of the Bentham uh, papers would have been fully transcribed would be 2081 at the earliest. However, if volunteers continue at the current rate of participation, then that landmark will be hit uh, later this decade, which was an unthinkable prospect back in 2010. Um, Ad mentioned um, Transcribus. Um, one of the many unforeseen consequences of Transcribe Bentham was when we were invited in 2012 to participate in the Transcriptorium project, which then led to the Read project, which fully developed the Transcribus platform, where we work with our colleagues across Europe to um, develop these solutions for handwritten text recognition. And ultimately, um, incorporating this transformative technology into a crowdsourcing project opens further um, very exciting avenues. So to quickly sum up, um, I think Transcar and Bentham would hopefully have met with Bentham's approval through the initiative's use of technology to democratise the creation of and access to knowledge and humanities research and to enable the task to be completed in as efficient and cost-effective way as possible. Many hands make light work, wrote Bentham in 1783, but many hands together make merry work. And I think Transcribe Bentham continues to prove the truth of that particular maxim. And I will cease there and uh, thank you for, for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, two inspiring use cases. Um, we are running out of time, so um, I give the priority to the question from the audience. So, Iris, uh, do we have some questions for our panelists? Yes, uh, there are several questions. Uh, I'm going to start with um, one that was asked a bit early on. Um, just a minute, I just found it. Um, yes, um, sorry, how does it? Yeah, there was a question about how does EOSC plan to enable citizen scientists to access resources? I don't know if there, were, if there is someone who can answer that about EOSC. Um, I guess this resource will be available uh, online, but uh, is there anyone of you who can answer this? How does EOSC plan to enable citizen scientists to access resources? Maybe Thomas, no? Okay, we, we'll come back to it. Uh, <laughs> later on. Um, um, there were a question yeah. about the Bentham project. Uh, how did the Bentham project recruit volunteers? Um, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, it was um, at the start of the project, it was a mixture of um, advertisements to um, mailing lists. We did a mail shot to schools that the media coverage, we were very lucky to, to get that. Um, but more recently, it's been um, things like doing talks. One of my colleagues went to give several talks to institutions like the University of the Third Age, as we, the, the user profile is typically um, someone who's retired, someone with plenty of free time. So uh, uh, targeting those sort of communities seems to be the, um, the key, I think. Um, we, we tried placing a paid advert in History Today, a popular history magazine in the UK, but that had, had no effect. Um, it's a lot of and word of mouth as well also also helps. So, um, yeah, I think that's the, the main the main avenues. Thank you. 
I have a general question um, to all of you. Um, citizen project produce a new way, a new way to build knowledge uh, by crowdsourcing, by putting primary source um, into amateurs' hands. Uh, by finding new tools as well, as Thomas said, to achieve multidisciplinarity. Uh, you talk about multidisciplinary tools, uh, Thomas. Um, what's the status <laughs> of this new knowledge? I mean, how these projects are seen, received uh, by the academic world on the side and by the citizens on the other side? If anyone wants to answer, Thomas? Um, I will try to answer as briefly as I can, uh, but I will say that being a library manager and working within citizen science for the last three, four years, if the library, as Dirk points out, goes out into the academic environment as a knowledge broker, we are seen as a neutral player, and if we facilitate researchers talking together, in my opinion, cross-disciplinary research will spring up. There's another important point in Dirk's presentation is that uh, it's not um, a bespoke of, of, of facilitation would be very, very different from university to university. And in, in reality, not a lot of researchers spring in to begin with, but you can tailor it after the ones that actually reply. And in my opinion, Doing workshops facilitation, we have a talent program also that creates multiple examples of cross-disciplinary research. So I think it could be an engine for this moving forward. Uh, if, okay. if I can add to that, uh, Thomas. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, indeed, such such uh, the, the principle behind the single point of contact is not just for <clears throat> for uh, researchers and scientists to uh, to have an actual point where they can contact uh, people about services. It's also a, a playground, so to speak, for researchers to to meet each other, to uh, to share experiences. That that's potentially what a BSPOC, a single point of contact, can be. But it's also very much depends on what sort of BSPOC you'd like to be and. Uh, an important uh, as a factor in this is, of course, how much money you devote on creation and the creation and the uh, uh, the actual, let's say, uh, maintenance of a beast bug. If you have sufficient personnel available who are able to uh, to to facilitate researchers for such a uh, for the creation of such a playground, then then it should be uh, it, it should be it, it can be of great help towards interdisciplinary research. But then again, you need an actual, let's say, a, a full, a grand version of the beast buck uh, and not the necessarily the intermediate version of a beast buck. Thanks very much. And I have a question for Ad and uh, Tim as well, um, because um, I can see um, your project have some strong cultural and social issues. And uh, I see you have a lot of data, you have a lot of feedback as well, and um, it's the your your, your project uh, uh, are running from have been run from a long time. So, how to evaluate this impact? As I say in my introduction, maybe social science can have a role on that. And uh, yeah, just uh, do you have time and how to either evaluate these impacts because it's very important in citizen science project. Add, please. Yes, thank you. Well, um, at Europeana, we've developed a, uh, uh, an impact framework, which precisely deals with these kind of issues. So what we do normally do when we organize an event together with a partner, we also have, a, we start with a short Mentimeter session in which we ask specific questions about the level of knowledge, the level of interest of the participants and all kinds of other things. And we repeat that after the event. So this way we can monitor very, very well um, what, it, what the impact of, of working with digital heritage in this kind of way is. So we have lots of results of that. Uh, unfortunately, I could not cite from it because we have some case studies that we're going to, we're about to share uh, within two weeks with you. For instance, uh, with a large event in, uh, in Poland where we worked with uh, younger students and uh, the results were absolutely striking. So there are measurements in place to, uh, to, yeah, to measure the impact. Tim, do you want to add something? Yeah, um, I think one of the, besides the, um, just the impact of getting people involved with um, scholarly production, um, we've 
one of the most gratifying things is to see people who didn't necessarily have any experience of working with manuscripts, learning both how to transcribe old handwriting and to, to in many instances, when we set up the transcription toolbar so people could just click the button and it would add the markup. But now some of the people who've been involved from the start manually type the XML markup themselves and can do the structure in quite sophisticated ways when before taking part, they, they didn't have any idea how to do it. So that's, that, I think that's two particular things that we're most gratified by. Thomas, yeah. It's just briefly, if I may comment, I know we are running out of time, but it's to say that both Tim and Ed, you're, the, the work you're doing, first of all, it's impressive. And I think these scientific crowdsourcing projects has perhaps unlimited potential in order to engage the teaching environments in schools and high schools. And I think right now we have in Denmark two examples from my own university where it's fairly easy to engage motivated teachers in trying to enroll in these programs. Absolutely. Uh, because if you are willing to give back some sort of teaching material or platform in order for teachers to reflect on what are the pupils or, or what are they actually learning by transcribing or interviewing or sharing and, 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 and also it creates this sense of scientific literacy. I think that could potentially be a very, very large project where we could probably work together on some of that. So it's just a brief comment that's extremely gratifying to see what you do. And I think it could be built out in that direction. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think it, it is maybe a very good conclusion to this round table. I'm sorry, time is running out so fast. And uh, maybe, I don't know, Iris, maybe a last question from the audience. Sorry, it was only about my questions. No, I, I think I think there are no more questions uh, as far as I went through. Uh, just the question that I previously asked about EOSC is something that we, we bring to the shock uh, discussions. So thank you, Leah, for, for asking it. I think it's a very good conclusion, uh, Thomas, about uh, how to bring city science to education and involve students, uh, raise the awareness of uh, citizen science uh, in education and uh, among students, because it contributes as well to make a link with, uh, you know, reliable information, science. And in this uh, year, we've seen a lot of issues of uh, misinformation, uh, fake news about uh, science. So I think this is a really relevant remark uh, for the future. And to rebuild trust, yes. trust in science, yeah. Thank you, exactly. thank you to very much. Trust. Maybe we can uh, finish here. So uh, thank you very yes. much to all of you. Thank you to uh, Iris for uh, the, the organization. It was really great. Thank you to all of the panelists. Your projects are really, really inspiring. And I'm sure that uh, there will be some connection between you and uh, to maybe uh, um, to share our best practices and all this, uh, all this innovation um, in uh, learning and, and uh, in building, sci uh, building knowledge as well. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.